is the Fodingham Iron Works, which was the founder of the whole of the great Appleby Fodingham Steel Company, a small corner site hemmed in by road, rail and steelworks. The largest and greatest steel plant in the Commonwealth started from two small furnaces built here. From the top of number one furnace can be seen the Grimsby Doncaster Railway, which runs alongside the plant. And we see the top of the old number two furnace, which is dying today, January the 11th, 1950. This was the first furnace built by the company back in 1865. In the background can be seen the brick hoist tower, which was built at the same time. Behind this is number four furnace, which was the first mechanically charged furnace in Great Britain, built in 1905. From this old small furnace has grown the great Appleby Foddingham Steel Company, producing one-tenth of this country's pig iron. We must never forget the debt we all owe to this furnace. Tapping the last cast of iron from number two furnace shows us the dark, congested conditions. Along these plates, many millions of tons of iron have been wheeled to feed this old furnace. The ore is all shuffled by hand into barrows weighing 700 weight and carrying 1800 weight loads. Each man had to fill and pull approximately 30 of these barrows in every shift, which, when you think of it, is pretty hard work. Not many years ago, there was no cover over this area. All furnacemen had to serve many years' apprenticeship at barrow pulling before moving to front side jobs. It was indeed the survival of the fittest. The barrows are wheeled over the weighbridge where the weight is recorded and the filler receives his instructions from the next load. From the weighbridge, the barrows are wheeled to the bottom of the hoist, which raises the barrows to the top of the furnace. This hoist can only take two barrows at a time. When the ore arrives at the top of the furnace, it is wheeled away from the cage and is tipped into the hopper by two men. Two men handle all the ore for this one furnace, producing in its turn 1,100 tons of iron per week and consuming 5,000 tons of iron ore and coke. There's no roof and there's no protection. Think of this scene on a cold, windy winter's night. It was not unknown for the wind to blow so strongly that the barrow took charge of the man. There is very little room at the top of the furnace, and even less room for mistakes. Today, with a modern furnace, nobody works on top, and nobody is exposed to these conditions. The bell is lowered, and the charge of ore and coke drops into the furnace. At the same time, because this is an old single bell furnace, the poisonous blast furnace gas escapes as either a dense cloud of fume or sometimes a sheet of flame. If the wind is in the east, the fumes or flame blow back on the man operating the charging gear at the top of the hoist. Not at all a pleasant job, but a job which had to be done. Before the furnace can be cast, sand beds must be prepared into which the iron can run. Wooden patterns are rammed into the sand and channels so made in which the iron can be cast into convenient sized pieces. This is hard back aching work. Today there is a roof over the beds. But again, think of this job in the days gone by and there was no protection from the weather. The job had to be done and always as one set of moulding was being put in there was the realization that another set had to be in in another four hours. An unending job, molding, casting, 
breaking, carrying off, repeated every four hours, 365 days of the year, winter and summer. Hard, back-aching labor under most unpleasant conditions. And it had to go on continuously. The furnace must be kept going. You will notice the men as they go along the beds, occasionally stopping to pick out the odd pieces of scrap. This is very necessary because molten iron hitting one of these pieces of cold scrap would cause a miniature explosion with the result that many a man has lost an eye or has been severely burnt as a result of such accidents. The father of one of our blast furnace staff lost an eye by this accident happening. Notice how the gang works as a team. the last flush of slag from this old furnace. Notice how congested is the whole working area, so much so that slagging was a much more unpleasant job than on an up-to-date plant. The runner is very flat so that when slag is slightly limey it runs only with difficulty and has to be helped down by continuous raking and poking. Slag ladles are of only six tons capacity and only two ladles can be set at one time. Remember this view when looking at later photographs of South Ironworks. Notice how close to the furnace are the slag ladles. There is little room to work and little room to get out of the way of trouble, so often present, or fumes which are always present. Julius Berendt, who managed this plant for 40 years, is talking to his successor, Clem Dawson, the present manager, who took over in 1949. The old and the new, the one succeeding the other, the one inheriting the experience and traditions of the old Frodingham, which made the new Frodingham possible. Without many of these troubles, which were part of the daily lot of Julius Berendt and his contemporaries, there would be no plant at South Ironworks today and we must never forget the debt we owe to these old people. Julius Perrin talking to his old colleague Arthur Robinson. This group of old employees of the company, all of whom have worked on number two furnace at one time or another, averages over 42 years with the company. Manager Julius Perrin, front sideman Wilson, crusherman Prentice, iron carrier Newborn, stove minder Briggs, hoist driver Parker, Foreman Lawson and Foreman Tom Cook all played their parts, very great parts, in making possible the development of the company from its early beginnings. The furnace is now ready for casting and the tapping hole has to be opened by hand drilling, hammer and bar. This also is hard work. In the old days it was not unusual for this job to take two or three hours of hand drill, sledgehammer and bar hard back-aching work, often carried out in conditions of difficulty and even of danger. If the furnace is in trouble, or there is difficulty in opening the hole, it becomes a grim race against time, as iron, confined too long, has a nasty habit of breaking out in awkward and nasty places. The iron is tapped and flows down the runner to the moulding we saw being put in earlier.
speed of casting increases as the tap hole wears bigger with the rush of iron and slag through it. Notice how if the iron is sluggish, it is pulled along by means of a wooden pole or pulling on stick. The use of cold steel would result in an explosion. Many furnacemen have been severely burned because of such an accident. But when looking at this view, think again of what the job was like when there was no protection from the weather. It was at times an exciting business running iron into beds which were covered with snow or into beds which were saturated by heavy rainfall. In each bed of iron, there is only about one ton and a half of iron, 16 pigs to the ton. Think of the millions of tons of iron produced in the world today, and think of what it would mean if all that iron had to be handled by these methods. Yet, Foddingham was built by men who had to use these methods because none other were available to them. They played their part in making future developments possible. Sand is thrown on the iron in order to keep it warm enough so that it can be broken from the sow in about half an hour's time. Another purpose of the sand will be seen later. Towards the end of the cast, slag comes with the iron and is diverted by the skimmer into the slag needles. A crowd of people round about are spectators who came to see the last of number two furnace. From 1865 to 1950, for more than the lifetime of the average man, this furnace has been producing iron, day after day, night after night, until at the end of its career, it has produced well over three million tons of pig iron, which has been no small contribution to the success and prosperity of the town of Scunthorpe. The tap hole is closed by this old mud gun, which in its day, which was many years ago, was a very great advance on the hard work of hand stopping. The steam gun is obsolete now, but it meant a great deal when it was introduced 30 or 40 years ago. The gun is swung into the hole, and as the tap hole is stopped, Julius Berendt pulls wind off number two furnace for the last time. There is no snort wheel on this furnace, and you can see clearly there is very little room for the men to work. But remember, this is very old plant. So died number two blast furnace, the founder of the Appleby Frodingham Feast. After the front side men have stopped the hole and put on wooden clogs, they had to break each pig of iron away from the sow. This was the work that really gave furnacemen wet shirts. The iron on which Bobby Newborn is walking is at a temperature of about 900 degrees centigrade and his only protection is the sand which his mate is throwing from the left. That was really when furnacemen worked under difficult and unpleasant conditions. After watering the iron, it had to be carried off into railway wagons waiting alongside. Iron carrying is indeed a dying art. Watch especially the man in the middle, Fred Smithson. Notice the skill and ease with which he inserts his hooked hammer under the end of the pig, lifts, taps off the sand, swings the pig across his knee and walks to the wagon. At Appleby Frodingham, the record amount of iron ever carried by one man was 88 tons in less than an eight-hour shift. Iron carrying was indeed a man's job. Remember that if the iron had been overwatered, it was liable to break, as the man was carrying it to the wagon. More than one foot has been broken this way. As the men threw the pig into the wagon, 
there was always the possibility of being dragged with it as a ragged piece caught on the man's clothing. From the old we go to the new, from number two furnace at Fottingham Ironworks to numbers nine and ten at South Ironworks. This is the stockyard with the ore bridge. The ore bridge can take 12 ton bites with its grab and load 600 tons of ore per hour into the 50 ton transfer car on the furnace high line below, which are the ore and coke bunkers for the furnaces. In the background can be seen the two gas holders, each containing 3 million cubic feet of gas. There is lots of room, space and air, commodities which were always scarce on the old blast furnace plant. To the right is the Sinter plant, a development undreamed of last century. The transfer car takes the raw material, the iron ore, Sinter, etc., from the stockyard and deposits it into the furnace bunkers. There is no heavy manual labour involved. Almost every operation is carried out by mechanical and electrical means. But when we see modern plants of this kind, let us never forget the work of the men we saw earlier who had to make the creation of such a plant possible. Remember the old hoist at number two furnace and contrast it with the impressive complicated structure for serving number nine furnace on the left. Coming in on the left, there is the coke car going back to the reception end of the conveyor belt from the coke ovens to receive its load of 30 tonnes of coke. From the high line, we go to the bottom of the bunkers, from which the ore and coke is fed to the scale cars. Instead of handling 1,800 weights, this car handles 12 tonnes with very little effort on the part of the man controlling it, so that it is possible that over 3,000 tonnes of ore and coke can be charged into each furnace per day by the work of only one man who operates both hoist and scale car. Each skip going up this main hoist is carrying six tons of iron ore. The hoist house, from which the hoist derives its power, is a clean, well-built, well-lit building and nobody is normally working inside it. A very great contrast from the old engine house at Foddingham. This shows so clearly how electricity and mechanisation have replaced hard work and muscle but it was the hard work of our predecessors who made possible this modern miracle. The front side of number nine furnace is very different from the front side of number two. The slag fall is steep and deep and discharges into 18 ton slag needles. There is plenty of room around the slag fall for men to work, plenty of light. Instead of using hammer and bar and hand drill, the tap hole is opened by compressed air drill, followed by oxygen lance. A 
Freddie Hike worked on the old furnace and now on the new furnace. Alan Glentworth, who never worked on the old furnace, inherited the fruits of his predecessor's efforts. He is inserting the oxygen lamp into the tap hole. Frank Betts, who has been with the company many years and worked on the old furnace as well as on the new, takes advantage of protective clothing to fit the oxygen lance into the hole. Iron flows with no difficulty or trouble. Think back to number two furnace, the opening of tap holes by hammer and bar, and think of this in times of trouble when the opening of the tap hole was a race against time and there was no oxygen lance to help. Furnace work has travelled a very long way today. There is plenty of room, there is no heavy manual work. Deep runners. Poised above the runner is the sample spoon which determines the success of the furnisman's skill. Freddie Hike stands watching, keeping an eye on the iron, but not having to work as Freddie Hike had to work 30 years ago when casting a blast furnace into sand beds. Instead of sand beds, the iron goes into a 65-ton ladle and then to the steel furnace or to the pig casting machine. The hard work of moulding, breaking and carrying has been eliminated forever. In place of the old steam gun is the robust remote-controlled electrical gun which closes the tap hole even against terrific flows of iron with no men near. Perhaps the greatest contribution in the welfare of blast furnacemen was the invention of the modern tap hole gun.